Okay, let's get started. A um, couple quick announcements. The first one is unfortunately one of our candidates for the open position in biology decided to take a job somewhere else before coming and seeing how wonderful we are. Um, so there won't be a biology seminar tomorrow, unfortunately. Uh, second thing has to do with the midterm, and a lot of people ask me, what are you going to normalize to? Um, what I did is I took the first two exams, just added them together, and it looks like the normalization for the two added together is going to be around about 82. Um, so 42 for the first one, 40 for the second one. Turns out that's not exactly the scores that people got to get to that point. Um, there are two clear, obvious outliers, and you probably know who you are. Um, and we won't talk any more about that. Um, there are a couple of other things that I did want to go over as far as exam questions are concerned. These are the ones that more than 80% or around 80% or more missed. And that to me means it was probably a bad question or I did a bad job of explaining it. So <clears throat> that being said, um, just a couple of them that I wanted to go over here. Um, and these are the you know, question numbers from each of the different exams. I think I got them right, um, A4, B45, and C31. Um, process of basic excision repair requires how many different enzyme activities, glycosylase, AP endonuclease, phosphodiesterase, DNA polymerase, and ligase, which makes five. So um, this, again, this is great for me writing the multiple choice answers because it's really easy to go one through five. It's a lot harder to answer them because you've got to think of those um, individual ones. Uh, and any, sorry, please stop me with these. I'm going to try and go through them relatively quickly. Um, this one, uh, I think 4% of the people got the same answer as me, which means I did a really, really, really crummy job of explaining it. Um, primer for replication of non-retroviral retrotransposons is made by DNA primase, reverse transcriptase, integrase, endonuclease, or exonuclease. Um, the key here really is where's the primer? What's the primer? It's got to be a 3 prime OH. Where does that 3 prime OH come from? It comes from this cut DNA. And that's in the middle of DNA, so it's going to be an endonuclease. So again, maybe I didn't do a, well, obviously I didn't do a very good job of explaining this um, in the whole process. So, um, and part of the reason that these are so important is that 40 odd percent of our genome is these things. So now, quite what they're doing there, I think is not completely clear, but there's a heck of a lot of them. And so trying to understand what's going on with them, I think is very important. Second strand synthesis is a whole different story. <clears throat> This is another one that a number of people seem to have uh, problems with, again, because I think I did a bad job of explaining it. So um, if a cell had a mutation in one HACA box snow RNA, there are about 200 in any given cell. So there are lots and lots of these things. What would you expect? No functional ribosomes, no pseudouridines anywhere, no methylated riboses anywhere, one fewer pseudouridine, or one fewer methylated ribose. Um, so it's one fewer pseudouridine. And the, <clears throat> the take on that really has to do with the fact that all of these snow RNAs have specific sequences. Each of these little red lines here represents a base pairing interaction. And so that base pairing interaction is going to direct the snow RNP, which has the enzymatic activity, to one particular place in your preribosomal RNA. And so if you have a mutation in one of them, and a couple of people ask me this. When I say mutation, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to be a mutation which completely knocks out the activity of that particular gene. Um, and if there's anything different, I will try and specify that. Um, so, and a couple of people ask me that during the exam, and yes, so it's basically gone. And then, of course, pseudouridine versus <coughs> methylation of ribose. These are only a few of the modifications, but they're the most common modifications that happen um, in ribosomal RNA. So the next and last one that I wanted to talk about um, has to do with this question, and maybe people would argue that this is a trick question. Um, the initiator tRNA can be found in both the P site and the E site, because once you've added that first amino acid, the ribosome translocates, and so the initiator tRNA is going to be in the exit side as well. Again, 
You could argue with me whether that was a trick question. You wouldn't win the argument. Uh, and that actually does remind me of one other thing um, having to do with the exam. We'll get you in just a sec. Uh, <laughs> uh, having to do with the exam. And there are a couple of suggestions um, that I've posted on how to do better on Stedman's exams versus the previous time. Um, one of the best suggestions that I saw for that was look at the slides, look at the figures that are in the lectures, and go over them in ridiculous minutiae, uh, because that's what I do when I write the exams. I pull up the lecture notes, and I go through it, and that's where I write my questions from. OK, sorry. <laughs> OK, so the, the question here is, is, a, is a very good one. Is it still an initiator tRNA once it's lost its methionine or formal methionine um, after it's moving through? So the tRNA by itself is a tRNA. And the initiator tRNA is a different sequence than the methionyl tRNA that you have in the middle of your protein. And so that RNA is a very specific RNA. And it's got to in interact with the initiation factors. IF2 and EIF2, whereas all the other ones are interacting with the elongation factors. Okay, again, sorry if I didn't make that clear. And again, the, I'm bringing these up because I think I did a bad job the first time around. At least that's what seems to be happening as far as the exam is concerned. Yeah, in the back. So what's the exam going to be bringing to the exam? So this particular exam, normalization is going to be to 40. And, but I only ever normalize when I do final grades to all three exam scores. And at this point, the normalization for the first two exams would be to 82. And that counts as 100%, and then scaling from there. Okay. Other exam questions. I have Scantrons here. Remind me at the end of class, and I don't forget, and I'll give them back to you. OK, so today, we're going to continue with regulation. Again, we'll do this through almost the end of the term, which is Way too soon, relatively speaking. Um, continue talk. Last time we talked about DNA binding and dimers. We're going to talk a little bit more about DNA binding today, much more about motifs, and then putting all of this stuff together and finally actually talk about real transcriptional regulation, um, particularly for bacteria here. This is where we sort of ended off last time. The big picture here is really alpha helix sticking in the major groove of DNA. This was the example I used for the helix turn helix DNA binding motif that's found very regularly in bacterial transcriptional regulators. And we just started talking about the zinc finger. Again, this is a motif. Motifs are what? They're sequences in your amino acids primary structure, so the sequence of amino acids that you can then predict are going to have some kind of function in the context of a domain which has a full structure. So you can predict what you know, two helices right next to each other and say, oh, that looks like it might be a helix turn helix motif. A zinc finger motif, and getting back to Ian's question from last time, is how do you know that it's likely to be a zinc finger? Well, there are two types, and I should really have you know, two rather than multiple here. Um, they are amino acid sequences that have cysteines separated by two any amino acids together with histidines that are separated by three amino acids relative to each other. Cysteines and histidines are pretty rare amino acids. You don't find them very commonly in proteins. So if you have a particular amino acid sequence that has cysteine, two amino acids later, another cysteine, histidine, three amino acids later, histidine, or two sets of these, so cysteine, two amino acids, cysteine, cysteine, two amino acids, cysteine. It's a pretty good bet that that's going to be coordinating zinc and very often is going to be giving you a zinc finger nucleotide binding motif. So not always, but it's a pretty good indication. And since just from amino acid sequence, we can't predict structure very well, um, these are a few of those little things you can go, oh, this is kind of what it looks like. So these 
zinc fingers are in many ways similar to helix turn helix. And we talked about homeo domains last time. We'll look at some other things here. Again, it's about putting an alpha helix into the major groove of DNA. Um, here, there's this alpha helix, which is held together between you know, cysteines and beta strands and an alpha helix here. This sits down in the major groove of DNA. There also are zinc fingers. Each of these gray blobs here represents a zinc, which have, again, alpha helices sitting down in here, but not with these two beta strands that are right next to it. So for the majority of these specific DNA binding proteins, they're going to have an alpha helix that sits down in the major groove. This is by no means the only way that you can bind to DNA. And this is one of my favorite examples here. Um, the methionine repressor, we'll talk more about these repressors, particularly amino acid metabolism a little bit later on. But one of the, my colleagues, when I was in graduate school, again, in the late Middle Ages, um, she was working on this particular protein, um, the MET repressor protein. And as she was working on this particular protein, the high resolution structure of just the protein was solved. And the researchers who did this structure said, hey, you know, check this out, alpha helix here, about you know, 3.4 yeah, so, uh, angstroms, no, 3.4 nanometers, excuse me, away, another alpha helix, perfect to fit in two adjacent major grooves of the DNA. That's going to be where it binds, right? Wrong. Um, it turns out that it's this other side of the protein. These two beta strands, actually, which sit down in the major group of DNA. And my colleague, again at the time, she said, um, these guys are totally wrong because all the mutations that you find in this protein that no longer bind to DNA are over here. They're not over here. And so, yeah, the geneticists were right, and the original proposal was actually incorrect as far as that's concerned. But again, this is just basically to show that, as true with practically everything in biology, there are exceptions. Um, relatively rare, but certainly there are some of these exceptions. The other kind of thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of DNA binding, and this is unfortunately really confusing because most people kind of get this wrong, and it's wrong in a lot of textbooks as well, uh, has to do with dimerization versus DNA binding. So here, a lot of people talk about leucine zippers as being DNA binding proteins. A leucine zipper is not a DNA binding uh, protein. It's a motif, which every seven amino acids has a large hydrophobic residue. But we talked about that when we talked about protein structure right at the beginning. Those then, since every seven amino acids are on the same side of an alpha helix, those can interact with each other. And so you have a dimerization thing that happens. And so that's your leucine zipper. If your leucine zipper happens to have a couple of helices right next to it, which are usually very basic helices, why basic? DNA, so negative charge, positive charges. So you have basic helices. Very often, they will bind to the DNA. But just the leucine zipper by itself um, actually is <clears throat> not going to bind to DNA. If it's got a basic helix, yes, it will. One of the favorite questions from my actually only course I took in biology as an undergraduate um, was whether a zinc finger could get caught in a leucine zipper. And I'll let you think about that. So um, that's one of the dimerization motifs. And then the other dimerization motif is again incredibly creatively named helix loop helix. <laughs> so big difference here um, between the helix turn helix and the helix loop helix is actually the length of this little red thing right here. So the loop is a lot longer um, as the turn is usually only three or four amino acids. Here it's a considerably longer one. And again, we're looking here at a dimerization motif, helix loop helix. If there happens to be a basic helix right next to it, then, excuse me, um, it can be part of a DNA binding protein. But again, helix loop helix, again, is just dimerization. And again, unfortunately, a lot of times people use these dimerization motifs interchangeably with the DNA binding proteins. It's not true. They have a basic helix? Yes, they can. Um, now, these are a little different. Also, you'll notice, 
We talked about the 3.4 nanometer difference between the adjacent major grooves. You have one protein that's sitting down on the side, so each of those alpha helices is 3.4 nanometers apart. These guys, you'll notice that their basic helices are a lot closer together, so they actually end up sticking into the major groove right next to each other. So they're doing, uh, covering a much larger part of the major groove, which is what's shown here, and many more base pairs than the four to five that we looked at when we looked at them last time. So why am I concentrating so much on dimers? We talked dimers last time. We looked at the different pieces of DNA that you could have your individual monomers bind to. You've got then much higher specificity because you've got two separate sequences. The other thing that these dimers and dimerization domains can do is they allow you to have so-called heterodimers. Heterodimers is just two different proteins coming together. What we talked about last time were homodimers, two of the same protein binding to the same sequence in an inverted repeat kind of structure. Here, if you have a heterodimer, each of those halves of your dimer can bind potentially different sequences, and you can mix and match all of these. And so, just in a very simple case here, we've got two different proteins. They're dark green and light green. They could bind as a homodimer, either light green to red sites, dark green to blue sites, or as a heterodimer, dark green, light green. Say, for instance, this has a leucine zipper motif here. Just every seven amino acids, large hydrophobic. So these guys can all bind to each other. So we've got two different proteins that can now bind to three different sequences. And you can imagine the more and more of these you have, the more kinds of possible interactions that you could have. And it turns out that this is exactly what happens with a lot of the basic helix leucine zipper proteins, basic helix loop helix proteins, etc. So lots and lots of heterodimer formation, which allows much more flexibility in terms of structures. And so here's just an example up here, behind the clicker question, um, two different mating type proteins, what we may talk a little bit more about later. And sometimes you'll even have proteins that have two separate DNA binding proteins that are actually part of the same protein. And so you can kind of think of this as a, say, monomer, but it's binding in two different sites with actually two different kinds of DNA binding motifs. In this case, a classic homeodomain and then a slightly different kind of binding motif. So mixing and matching for heterodimers um, is also a, a very important process. The last thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of dimers <clears throat> is a, another very important aspect of dimers, and it has to do with the relative concentrations that you need to get binding to a particular piece of DNA. So here's just the example of nanog. Anybody know what nanog is? It's a regulatory protein that turns out to be absolutely critical for embryonic stem cells. And you can actually take three transcriptional regulators and overexpress them in most cells and turn them into embryonic stem cells. Absolutely mind-blowing. Um, but nanog is one of those. Um, turns out to be important for head development um, as well. But as far as we're concerned, it's a pretty boring DNA binding protein Turns out to be a transcriptional regulator, again, really important for development. Um, binds to this consensus sequence, so nucleotides two and three, always adenines, most of the time thymines, etc. And they, you know, there's variability. Sometimes it's going to bind to these sequences more so or less so. And clearly, if you've got a sequence which is closest to the consensus sequence, which would be TAA, TTGC, it's going to bind very tightly less so, not as well. So this is also very often what's going to be called a half site, again, because this is normally binding as a dimer to your sequence. Here's that dimer sequence. This is what? <clears throat> this is what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven nucleotides. Uh, 
seven nucleotides, particularly in something like the human genome, you're going to find that really frequently. Fourteen nucleotides, you're going to find once or twice at random in the whole human genome. So we've got <clears throat> lots of possibilities. Again, heterodimers, homodimers, etc. But most important here is what happens in terms of binding to any given DNA sequence. And this has to do with how these dimers are coming apart or going together. If you have really strong interactions between the two proteins before they interact with DNA, that means that basically you'll have a, what looks like a single protein binding to that single site. And as the concentration of that particular protein increases, say you've turned on the gene to make that protein, over a pretty wide range of protein concentrations, it will bind and then slowly get up to be mostly bound. If, on the other hand, the protein-protein interactions forming this homodimer are relatively weak, but once they're on DNA, they're quite strong, this changes the relative occupancy or the amount of DNA bound by any given protein quite a bit in terms of this curve with protein concentrations. Low protein concentrations, these monomers never come together. You never get dimers, so you don't have binding. However, once they do come together, then you get really good binding. And basically what this does is it means that low concentrations, you have no presence of this protein on the DNA. And at higher concentrations, you have very close to complete binding to this particular piece of DNA. And this is really important if you think about switching genes on and switching genes off, is that you want to have a relatively narrow range of protein concentration where you go from one state, i.e. the non-bound state, to the bound state. This is the second reason you're going to want to have dimers, is giving you this what's called the cooperative change going from non-bound to bound. Mm -hmm. um, the one on the right, is that the cooperative binding, or are they both different types? Like the, the, the graph to the right is the cooperative binding. Um. OK, from, from this point of view, yes. So the right, the right point of view, this is where you have cooperativity. And it's really about this binding of the dimer being much stronger and more frequent than the binding of the individual ones to each other. And we looked at cooperativity way back when, again, before the midterm. We talked about some of the single-stranded um, DNA binding proteins, like RecA or SSB. You have the first one that binds, and that helps a whole bunch more bind. So it's very much an on-off kind of switch. Same kind of thing here. OK, he's pausing for way too long. What does that mean? <laughs> See, eventually, you know, everyone will be so well trained that I won't even have to tell you this. So um, <clears throat> dimeric helix turn helix containing proteins, I'll use HTH all the time, often have their recognition helices about 34 nanometers, that's 3.4 angstroms apart. No, shut up. Blech. Not 3.4 angstroms, 340 angstroms apart. Apparently so that they can act as leucine zippers, form heterodimers, bind cooperatively, bind adjacent major grooves, bind major and minor groups. So tight. <clears throat> okay, someday we'll get 100% here. Um, still working on it. It has to do with, again, adjacent major grooves, so your protein is sitting down on one side of the DNA, and this is extremely common in terms of helix turn helix proteins. That does remind me. Um, speaking of clicker questions, um, I just uploaded 
um, what should be all the clicker questions up to now. It seems it's for some of the classes, not all the clicker questions got registered. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, but what that means is there will be you know, the maximum number of points there is going to be um, somewhat lower. So um, hopefully we'll get most of these and, and most of these taken care of. So I think it's because I don't disappear the results appropriately. OK, so that's um, helix turn helix proteins. Um, and particularly, again, true in bacteria, these are mostly homodimers uh, rather than heterodimers, probably just because the genomes are a little bit smaller here. But bacteria are great because their DNA doesn't have all of these histones that are getting in the way. Uh, it turns out that, of course, eukaryotic systems do have um, a lot of histones that get in the way. And we talked a little bit about this when we talked about chromatin structure earlier on in the course, and that nucleosome breathing takes place. And so, yes, we've got our you know, wrap around the histone core, um, and everyone sort of thinks about that as being a very stable structure, but the DNA is coming on and off um, quite often. And if you're trying to have your favorite transcriptional regulator binding to, say, this sequence right here, um, it still can bind, even though it's associated with nucleosomes, because it's coming off some of the time. Now, what's interesting is if it's near this end of the nucleosome, it comes off quite frequently. Not surprisingly, if it's kind of in the middle, it comes off a lot less frequently. Actually, this is this one right here. Um, so that you know, gives you an indication that, yes, there is some of this breathing going on. But what other way do we have to deal with these things that are sort of in the middle of nucleosomes? Remember what was in pre-initiation complexes for transcriptional regulation in eukaryotic cells? Chromatin remodeling complexes. So basically, in these cases, you have to have a chromatin remodeling complex to get good binding to whatever this regulatory sequence is here. Whereas in this case, much less so. But the other way, as well as having a specific chromatin remodeling complex, is you can have more cooperative interactions. Once you have DNA binding here by a specific DNA binding protein, the nucleosome is a relatively nonspecific set of DNA binding proteins, the binding of the first can also help binding of the second. Basically, you started to pull off the DNA from your nucleosome. And once you've started to pull it off, then a second site is going to be a lot easier to interact with. And so what seems to happen in many cases, and we'll talk about this much more when we talk about individual regulatory processes later on, is that you'll have a chromatin remodeling complex that allows one of these sequence-specific DNA binding proteins to associate with the DNA. But once that first one is associated, the rest of them, through these protein-protein interactions and cooperative interactions, seem to be able to displace the nucleosomes from these kinds of templates. Okay, So that's it for nucleosomes now. But again, we'll, we'll come back and talk about nucleosomes more a little bit later. I wanted to take a slight digression um, and talk about some methods. These methods are really important for knowing that a specific sequence relative to a nucleosome is available for binding or not available for binding, et cetera, and also figuring out where your favorite protein is binding to the DNA, or for that matter, what protein is binding to your favorite piece of DNA. So the first of these is called the EMSA, horrible acronym, usually called a band shift or a gel shift assay. But EMSA, if you can remember that acronym, actually tells you a lot more about what's happening here. It's an electrophoretic mobility, actually this should be um, shift assay. What do we mean by electrophoretic mobility? Hopefully all of you have done agarose gels. You know something about DNA gels. Um, basically, uh, you have one size of something, in this case DNA, will migrate with a relative velocity <clears throat> in a gel. If it's bigger, it's slower. If it's smaller, it's faster. So that's all that we really care about here. 
So if you have a piece of DNA, and let's for giggles just say this is a promoter, um, and that DNA by itself will migrate to a particular position. Now if you have this DNA plus a whole bunch of different proteins that you think might be interacting with a promoter, say a eukaryotic promoter and TF2D, TF2B, etc., then if they're actually interacting with this particular sequence, each of these interacting proteins will cause a shift in the mobility. So the normal mobility is down here at the bottom. These are each bigger pieces. Each of those bigger pieces is going to represent a protein or a complex of proteins bound to this particular piece of DNA. Um, this is the sort of optimal kind of interaction here. Never happens this nicely. This is a real world example here. We have our DNA down here at the bottom, and then we're trying to separate each of these things that are binding to our DNA using some kind of, in this case, column chromatography. You remember that, you know, TF2A, TF2B, TF2C, TF2D, where the heck did all of those names come from? They actually come from A being the first, B being the second, C being the third, et cetera, just to come off some of these columns. So <clears throat> here, down at the bottom, if we look at, oops, go back here, the, this band shift experiment, you have this DNA down at the bottom, not bound to something, and then all the proteins that are here in your fraction C2, that will bind to your DNA and give it an electrophoretic mobility shift. Here, C1 turns out to be a little bit different on the column, which has a slightly different charge. It's up here, and so on and so forth. So you're taking each of these individual pieces here, lined up bottom to top, and saying, okay, here in this particular fraction, we've got something that moves your DNA this far. In this fraction, you've got something that moves your DNA a little bit further. Something's binding to this piece of DNA, but what is it? So then you've got to do other techniques. So the classic one of those is what's called affinity chromatography, where you now have a particular DNA sequence, and you want to know what protein is binding to it. So the way that you do this is usually a two-step process, because when I didn't mention before, and I should have in terms of transcriptional regulators, particularly in eukaryotic cells, I mentioned about 10% of the genes seem to be transcriptional regulators, but it turns out that the amount of any of those particular gene products is usually extremely small, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny amounts of any of these individual proteins. So it's kind of the proverbial needle in the haystack trying to pull these things out. So the first thing that you want to do if you've got all of these proteins from a particular cell is just separate out the ones that could be binding to DNA at all from all the ones that are not binding to DNA. And a classic example of that, you think about all the proteins that are present inside the cell. Um, we've got huge amounts of ribosomal proteins. We talked about the proteasome a couple of lectures ago. These are your really, really common proteins that you have inside the cell. So the first thing you want to do is separate the proteins that bind to DNA from those that don't bind to DNA. And so here, lots of different DNA sequences. You put your mixture in the top. Everything that doesn't bind to this column is not a DNA binding protein. We don't care about it. However, there's still going to be quite a few different ones. Again, 10% of the genes in the genome are encoding these particular DNA binding proteins. And there are going to be some DNA binding proteins, like those nasty histones, that bind really randomly to different pieces of DNA. So now you have a mixture of DNA binding proteins. Here, you take this mixture of DNA binding proteins and put them together with a very specific DNA sequence. And then, see what comes through. All of those proteins that don't bind to this specific DNA sequence are not the ones you're interested in. These are the ones now, hopefully, 
only one or very few of these proteins that are binding to your specific sequence. And now you can take these proteins and figure out what they are, either through protein sequencing or much more commonly these days with mass spectrometry to figure out what this particular protein is. So this is a way of purifying that protein that you think is binding to that one particular sequence, and probably you had an idea that it was one of those proteins because you had this DNA sequence you did an electrophoretic mobility shift assay with. So that tells you, okay, you've got a protein, it's bound to this particular sequence here. That's great, but it doesn't really tell you what's the exact part of that sequence. In this example here, we have a very short sequence, just six base pairs. Usually this is going to be a much larger piece, and particularly important if you look at these electrophoretic mobility shift assays. These pieces of DNA are often hundreds of nucleotide base pairs in length. So if you now have your protein, you want to find out exactly where it's binding to the DNA. You use a slightly different approach. And this is what's called DNA footprinting, or just DNA footprinting in general. And so the idea here is that you have your, yeah, let's see if I can try and get rid of this up here. So close this. Yeah. It's only getting me my pointer here. Um, <clears throat> our DNA up here at the top, your double-stranded DNA, which has a specific sequence in it that you think your protein is binding to, but you want to figure out exactly where that is. And the way that that's done is by taking this piece of DNA, binding your blue protein to it, and then chopping up this DNA in some way, if you don't have a protein that's bound here, it's going to chop this DNA up into little tiny pieces, and in the best of all possible worlds, it's single nucleotides. So this is so one nucleotide long, two nucleotides long, three nucleotides long, etc. So that's what happens if you just have the DNA by itself and you chop it into little pieces. If ever you have a protein that's bound to it, it's going to block that chopping activity. And so you're going to have a part of your DNA where it's not chopped up. And then if you separate all these DNA fragments, you'll see from this position here to that position there, you haven't chopped up your DNA. And if you haven't chopped up your DNA, this is where you had something which is blocking the chopping of that DNA. So this is your footprint. It's where that nucleic acid binding protein is associated with the DNA. So here, DNA footprint, since you know the sequence of this particular DNA, you can say, OK, in this approximately, this is actually about 100 bases here, this guy's binding from base 42 to 48. OK. <laughs> Mind reading. Eventually, yeah, by the end of the term, I'll, I'll get there. Um, so. <clears throat> That gives you that specific sequence with a specific piece of DNA. This is great, except if you don't know what the sequence is that your favorite protein is actually going to bind to. Say you're sequencing a new genome, and in that genome you find this really cool protein that's got a helix turn helix motif in it, and you think it binds to DNA, but you have absolutely no clue what it's binding to. So. This day and age, and again at the end of the term, we'll talk about how to make proteins recombinantly. You tweak your little E. coli, and it makes tons of protein for you. So you've got this protein, but you don't know what sequence it binds to. And so one of the really amazing things that's been done in the last couple of years, again, since I was thinking about starting graduate school, late dark ages, uh, the methods for synthesizing DNA, just making random pieces of DNA, is actually really easy to do. And so you can literally go online. There are multiple different companies that will make random DNA sequences for you. OK, so you've got random DNA sequences. Your protein that you think is really interesting and important for binding DNA, which one of those random sequences is the one that associates with your favorite protein? So it's literally, again, one of these needle in a haystack processes. You've got all of these random DNA sequences. You put them together with your protein, 
You hope that one of them is binding to your DNA protein. How do you tell this? DNA bound to protein, what's going to happen to that DNA? It's going to be bigger. So you can separate it in something like an electrophoretic mobility shift assay. So you do these electrophoretic mobility shift assays. You find this DNA that's associated with your favorite protein. Usually, this goes through multiple rounds here because it's going to bind to some sequences, a bunch of different sequences. And then eventually, you'll have a pretty homogeneous DNA sequence here bound to your protein. Again, it's been shifted in your gel electrophoresis experiment. Now you can sequence this and say, hey, I've got this you know, sequence of DNA. I've got this great sequence of DNA. It binds to my newly found protein. This is great and well and good, except that these were randomly synthesized DNA fragments, right? So does that bear any relationship whatsoever to what's going on inside the cell? That brings us to our next set of experiments and how you figure these things out, <laughs> called chromatin immunoprecipitation. Ridiculously long um, word, but actually says pretty clearly what is going on here. Almost all of us lazy molecular biologists just call this chip. So chromatin immunoprecipitation. So how do you do a chip experiment? So what you're trying to figure out here is, OK, we've got our protein. We probably have a pretty good idea what sequence it's interacting with in our randomly synthesized DNA sequences. What's it actually interacting with inside the cell? So the way that this is done is you literally take a cell, which is hopefully happily growing, has your favorite DNA binding protein in it. <clears throat> For instance, regulatory protein A up at the top here, the yellow one. And then cross-link all of these proteins to whatever DNA they're associated with. So now you have this massive mixture of all the proteins bound to all the DNA. And now what you need to do is pull out your favorite protein and the DNA that it's interacting with. So you put all these things together. Then the immuno part comes in. This is chromatin, right? Chromatin is the DNA protein association with each other. The immuno part is that because you had this protein and you plugged it into some poor unsuspecting bunny rabbits, you actually have antibodies to this particular protein. So now what you do is you take the antibodies to your protein and use those to just pull out that protein and the DNA that it's associated with from your whole mixture and then sequence the DNA that you find there. And so there are multiple different ways of determining this DNA sequence. Um, it used to be that people used DNA microarrays. That's this chip to chip. Um, because um, DNA microarrays, you have the whole genome spread out on one of these microscope slides, and then look and see what your DNA then associates with. That's totally old school technology now, you know, at least 15 years old. Um, and now what people will do is just sequence it, because it turns out the sequencing has gotten so easy and so cheap that you can sequence basically all of the DNA fragments um, that you have present here. And that's one of the ways that we found that 80% of the human genome, despite the fact it's all random and repeated, et cetera, has proteins that are associated with it. And on many of them, very specific DNA binding proteins. If you look at where the RNA polymerase is, RNA polymerases are all over the cell. Um, and it was found by literally exactly these kinds of techniques, taking your favorite cell, cross-linking the proteins to the DNA, separating out your favorite protein, so in the cases I was just mentioning, RNA polymerase, for instance, and then just looking where your RNA polymerase is in the whole genome by doing all of these sequencing. So um, very classic kind of technique. So we looked at electrophoretic mobility shift assays. We looked at DNA footprinting assays. We looked at chromatin immunoprecipitation. We talked about what, what else? Affinity chromatography. Another recommendation for exams is to print out the notes beforehand, which is why I post them. Um, so you can go back and look at those. Conveniently, these are five different things. Why does he have five different ones he wants to talk about? Because there are five different potential answers for a clicker question, of course. 
there's method to his madness. Um, so <clears throat> you know the DNA sequence that a transcriptional regulator binds to, but not the protein, which of the following methods would be best to isolate the protein? EMSA, DNA affinity chromatography, DNA footprinting, CELEX, or chromatin immunoprecipitation. Again, feel free to discuss this. You're not allowed to talk during exams, but now. One hundred people. Great. So we've got perfect statistics or something. Um, OK. We're divided somewhat, but most of them think DNA affinity chromatography. Why? Because it's helping to isolate your protein. Exactly. And none of these other techniques will actually help you to isolate your protein. Um, a lot of them actually depend on knowing what that protein is um, to be able to do it. DNA footprinting, you've got to have your protein already. Cell-X, you've got to have the protein already. Chromatin immunoprecipitation, you need to have an antibody to your protein, so you must have the protein already. So the only other one where you don't have your proteins already would be your electrophoretic mobility shift assay. So B it is. OK, I want to finish up last 18 minutes or so of lecture today um, talking about how we can now use what we know about these DNA binding proteins in terms of thinking about transcriptional regulation. So to <clears throat> start with this, I need to introduce the whole concept of an operon. So the operon concept was introduced by Jacob and Monod, two of the real giants in molecular biology, or the very beginnings of molecular biology, late 1950s, early 1960s, um, came up with this idea that multiple genes could be regulated by one very specific cis-acting sequence. And they called it the operator, beautiful genetic experiments. Um, to go into that, and we can talk way more about that later. But basically, they had this concept that there was going to be a specific cis-acting DNA sequence that's controlling a whole bunch of genes. And as we talked about before, many bacterial genes are polycystronic. And so your transcript has multiple different genes that are being made by one RNA polymerase from one promoter. So it's one promoter, multiple different genes, and one operator that's regulating all of those genes. So the classic example of this is the tryptophan operon, multiple different genes. All of these genes encode different enzymes, which are important for making the amino acid tryptophan. Now, why is tryptophan so important? Tryptophan is all of you remember from your amino acid structures, which I didn't ask you to remember here for this class. Tryptophan is one of the most complex. It's got two ring structures, very large, probably developed very late in the genetic code, but that's a different story. So lots of different enzymes that you need to make tryptophan. If you have tryptophan in your diet, or if you're in E. coli, you're feeding it um, tryptophan, is it worthwhile to make all of these things? Do the transcription, translation, et cetera? No. So in the presence of tryptophan, you don't want to be making all these things. In the absence of tryptophan, you do need tryptophan. So you will have to make it under some circumstances. And so the idea here is how to regulate what's going on with this <clears throat> particular operon. And operon's great because, again, it's one particular sequence. One promoter, all you need to do is regulate what's going on at that promoter. The promoter's not interacting with your RNA polymerase. No transcription. No tryptophan biosynthetic genes. You save yourself some energy. In the absence of tryptophan, then you need to be expressing all of those genes. So how does that happen? Very straightforward. This is the classic example of what's known as a repressor. And we'll talk much more about repressors as we move on here. So a repressor of transcription binds to the operator, and in this case, just blocks the RNA polymerase from binding. 
Great. Now, when do you want to have an active repressor? You want to have an active repressor when you don't want to be making these genes. And that will be in the presence of tryptophan. So with tryptophan, you want the repressor to be active. Without tryptophan, you don't want the repressor to be active. You want to get transcription going on. How does that happen? We happen to know the atomic structure of the tryptophan repressor. And we also really nicely know the atomic structure of the tryptophan repressor in the presence and absence of tryptophan. In the absence of tryptophan, this is what the <coughs> tryptophan repressor looks like. And as all of you can tell, um, <laughs> these alpha helices right here are not set up to bind to the DNA. It's a homodimer, again, binding to these inverted repeat sequences right next to each other. When tryptophan binds to the trip repressor, the structure changes. And now you have two alpha helices exactly 34 nanometers apart. So they can fit into adjacent major grooves of the DNA. Once they fit into these major grooves of the DNA, now the RNA polymerase can't bind there anymore. So presence of tryptophan, repressors bound to the DNA, blocking transcription. In the absence of tryptophan, it can't bind to the DNA. So the RNA polymerase binds there and will transcribe and then eventually translate um, all of these genes. This is a classic example of what's called negative regulation. We're talking about a repressor. So a repressor blocks the binding of the RNA polymerase. These <clears throat> repressors can bind in the presence of, in this case, tryptophan, so a particular ligand. In some cases, the presence of a ligand will actually cause a repressor to come off of the DNA. And we'll see that example when we talk about the lac operon in, in just a couple of minutes here. But the idea of negative regulation is it's a repressor preventing transcription by just not allowing the RNA polymerase to bind to a particular promoter. These repressors can be activated or repressed by ligand. So here, ligand binding has your repressor coming off of the DNA. Here, you've got a ligand causing it to bind to DNA. Now, this was thought, again, by these giants of molecular biology that Jacob and Minot, that this is the way that all genes were regulated. Very nice, simple mechanism. And in fact, again, back in the late dark ages when I was in graduate school, um, one of my professors, um, the late Hatch Eccles, um, tells this wonderful story about he was a young postdoc, just finished his PhD, just getting started doing independent research. And he was at a big meeting, and um, Jacob and Minot, these two giants of molecular biology, were listening to his talk. And he you know, goes through his whole talk, and at the end says, I think this might be an example of, of positive regulation, that there's actually an activator here. And apparently, <clears throat> Minot was sitting in the front row, said, eh, there's no such thing as positive regulation, <laughs> and stormed out of the room. Um, so it turns out that actually there is positive regulation. <laughs> and Minot was, in fact, incorrect in this case. And so positive regulation is just the flip side of negative regulation. Instead of having a repressor, which binds to the DNA and stops the binding of your RNA polymerase, it's a protein that binds to the DNA and stimulates the binding of RNA polymerase. So of course, you're not going to have your activator protein bound to <clears throat> the promoter site. It's not going to be overlapping where the RNA polymerase binds. It's going to be right next to it and helping it then to bind. So activator proteins right next to the RNA polymerase. And sometimes these will be binding to DNA in the presence of some kind of a ligand. Sometimes they'll be binding, excuse me, sometimes binding in the absence of ligand up here, and sometimes be binding in the presence of ligand here. So activated or pressed, and the activation or repression here just has to do with the binding of that activator right next to the promoter, helping to get your RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter. Once it's bound to the promoter, you'll get <clears throat> nice expression. Probably the best understood of these is a protein called CAP or CRP.
Um, again, unfortunately, two groups of biologists call this by different names. The first activator to really be well characterized, actually not the one that my biochemistry professor <laughs> was working with, but uh, that's a bit of a different story. I know it's the catabolite activator protein or the cyclic AMP response protein. So CRP for the CAMP response protein, catabolite activator protein. I'll try and call it CAP because I think it's an oh, activator protein. And not surprisingly, when it binds to catabolites, it's going to be having this activating role. And the activation is, again, it's just helping to bind to the polymerase. Now, let's look at a couple of examples um, in the last 10 minutes here. The first one is the lambda repressor. You know, quote, unquote, repressor. What does you know, Stedman mean when he puts something in quotes? Well, yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. Now, if you think about both these activators and repressors, it's all about DNA binding, right? And so it's where that particular protein binds to DNA is going to determine whether it's helping a RNA polymerase to bind to a promoter right next to it, or if it's in the middle of a promoter or too close to a promoter and binds there, it's actually going to block binding there. So it turns out that the lambda repressor binds to an operator right next to a promoter where it can serve as an activator if this binding site is in exactly the right position. But if it moves over one nucleotide, it turns out it blocks the binding of the RNA polymerase and serves as a repressor. So, and next term in virology, I know 53 of you have already signed up for it. Um, and we'll talk much more about how the lambda repressor slash activator is actually working. Yeah? So, if the, does it matter if it moves upstream or downstream? So, it turns out that, so the question here is, does it matter if it's upstream or downstream? Downstream clearly going to start overlapping with the RNA polymerase binding. So downstream, at least if it's overlapping with a minus 10, minus 35, which is what you have for our bacterial promoters, um, that's going to cause problems. If you move it upstream too far, turns out that almost all of the activation interactions, as you can kind of see here, let's get my pointer back, um, have to do with direct protein-protein interactions. So it's got to be close enough to the polymerase to actually bind to the polymerase and thereby stimulate the binding. So if you move it too far away, it doesn't work in most cases. On Friday, we'll talk about a really cool different example that I spent six years of my life working on. But that's, again, we'll get to there. <laughs> um, so it turns out that this wonderful activator protein, the cat protein, serves in exactly the same way as the lambda repressor. If it binds to the correct place relative to the promoter, then it serves as an activator. If it's the wrong place, it can actually serve as a repressor as well. So now I want to finish up talking about the LAC operon. The LAC operon is really the classic operon. I mean, in fact, it was the operon that was used by Jacob and Monod to come up with their operon model in the first place. Uh, and of course, you know, only negative regulation. The Silver line in that story, it turns out that the lac operon is also positively regulated, even though there's no such thing as positive regulation. Um, so this process here, um, and it makes sense because it's how they grew the cells originally, is why they didn't find this. Um, so the lac operon is, again, an operon. It's multiple genes controlled by one operator. What the genes do in the lac operon is they break down lactose. So if you have a E. coli cell that doesn't have glucose around, which is the best thing for it to use in terms of metabolism, and there is lactose around, the products of this operon will be made and then allow the cell to metabolize lactose. So um, there are three genes actually here, but we're just looking at, at one of them as the first gene of the sequence, and the LAC-Z gene is actually a beta-galactosidase. Lactose is a beta-galactoside. This enzyme will chop that into um, two separate pieces. So if you have lactose around, you're going to want to express the genes here, but you're only going to want to express them 
in the absence of glucose. You got glucose around, why do you need to break down your galactose, oh, sorry, your lactose into galactose and glucose? That's what lactose is made of. You got glucose around, there's no reason to have this. If, however, you don't have glucose around and you have lactose, you want to express these genes. If you don't have lactose around, there's no point in making it either because you know, no lactose is not going to work. So you have to have this kind of two different components which are doing the regulation here. At first, again, Jacob Minot thought it was just lactose, and so they just did the negative regulation. Um, so the idea here is if you have an E. coli cell that's got both glucose and lactose, you don't have gene expression here because you've got glucose around. Why bother making these extra genes? If you have, um, even in the presence of lactose, if you don't have lactose, still got plenty of glucose around, there's no reason to have this. And so this is what Jacob and Minot were studying. Is they're looking at this repressor protein, which is the LAC repressor protein, functions in negative regulation. Here, in the absence of lactose, it binds to your operator, which is blocking the binding of the RNA polymerase. If, however, you have the absence of lactose and the absence of glucose, You'll have your activator protein, this is your catabolite activator protein, again, lacking glucose, the catabolite is going to be lactose here, binds to cyclic AMP, would help to have your polymerase bind here, but there's no lactose around, the repressor is bound. So the only case where you actually have good expression of this gene is now in the presence of your activator protein and the absence of your repressor protein. And that's the only time you're going to get good expression of this particular gene. Now, what did Jacob and Minot get wrong? They always grew it in low glucose. So there was always this activator around. And so it was just the repressor from there. Yeah? So in this case, is glucose itself the repressor, or is it more of a secondary glucose? Okay, so the question here is what's, what's the actual regulator in this case? Um, so it's not glucose, um, it's the cyclic AMP. So it's a process where cyclic AMP is made in a starvation kind of condition, again, lack of glucose. So it is a second messenger, you're exactly right. Um, the lactose, however, is directly bound to the repressor. So this is not a secondary effect. Okay, everybody's happy with regulation? Yes? Good. Then we can ask one more question. Yay. OK. So if you have a mutant in the trip repressor that cannot bind to tryptophan but is otherwise normal, what transcription of the trip operon would you expect? No transcription under any circumstances. No transcription in the presence of tryptophan, but some in the absence. No change. Presence of tryptophan, but none without. Or a constitutive transcription. Constitutive transcription means on all the time. It looks like we might want more time. Is that true? Yes. yes. OK. Yes. <laughs> the answer is always yes. And that's not one. That's not A, B, C, or D, though. <laughs> OK. So um, we will start again. Everyone in the city needs to vote again, OK? We've got 45 seconds left in class, so it's good. Nine, five, 
we can, we'll, we'll talk more about this next time I have your Scantrons um, down here at the bottom. Yes, um, E is correct.